It's a, a great pleasure to be uh, with you guys here and uh, participate in this session. We have uh, a very uh, distinctive speakers all over the world. Uh, uh, we would like to thank also Dr. Ayman for the co-moderation. And I think we can start now. Our next uh, speaker will be Dr. Danish for a case presentation in uh, uh, surgical <clears throat> return. Dr. Danish, please. I have entitled this uh, presentation as Attitude Changes with Strong Neighbors. And as we go through it, you will realize why I said this. So this was a scenario of a 50-year-old male with high myopia who'd been previously operated for a bit, uh, had herbitual retinal surgery with a silicone oil endotamponade. And he developed uh, inferior retinal detachment with a small inferior break, which was threatening the macula. So he was taken up for re-VR surgery. And uh, when we took him up, I wanted to first support the macula before uh, removing the silicone oil. So I injected PFCL uh, initially and then began the silicone oil and just see what happened. So then very interesting thing. You can see a little bit of PFCL is being injected over here at the lower part of the, uh, just next to the retina. And then slowly small amount of silicone oil is removed, some fluid is replaced. And then some more PFCL has been injected over here. And after injecting the PFCL to support the macula, then we have started removing the uh, silicone oil and you can see the fluid replacing the oil. And now you see the oil has been removed and lo and behold, there is silicone oil at the bottom which refuses to move. This silicone oil has got stuck. And I tried my best to remove this with the cutter, with the flute needle, with a cannula, and I could not take it out. It refused to come out. It just got stuck at the bottom. And I was perplexed, what's going on? You can see this bubble, it's refusing to move. And finally, I thought that maybe there's a little bit of PFCL stuck to it. So I decided to start removing the silicone, the PFCL, and you see the silicone oil floated up. Still, there was a bubble left because I hadn't removed all the PFCL. And this bubble, you see that? I can make it move all around the place and I can't take it out. And you can imagine how frustrating it is. And finally, I removed all the PFCL removed the silicone oil and came out. So this was something completely unusual. And then we saw this in one more case before I stopped doing this procedure. I stopped, I started taking a chance on having an extension of the detachment rather than risking getting into this problem. Now, basically the important thing is that if you have this situation, you want to protect the macula, possibly a better thing would be to let some silicone oil come out so that it's no longer in contact with the retinal surface and then go right through to the retinal surface and then inject the PFCL if you want to do it. Otherwise, you may, you may get this shearing effect of the uh, PFCL of the, uh, when it goes through the silicone oil and it will not let it move out. But look at it this way. Maybe this alter gives us another alternative for managing inferior detachments where we want to give support for some time um, and we don't want to, uh, and we feel that silicone oil alone won't be enough. Maybe we can deliberately inject some silicone oil PFCL and then put the silicone oil bubble. The silicone oil bubble will not come out. The PFCL will support the inferior retina. And that's one option I'm passing on for everybody to think about. It may be a better way than just putting PFCL all the way to the top you know, which is advocated by Steve Charles. And you may be able to save some of your retinas that way if you are in a desperate situation, not as a routine. I'm not giving that as a routine, but this was something we learned through this case and through one more case, which happened after that. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Danish. This is very, very interested, uh, very interesting case actually. And I think we can, we can get, uh, 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 some question. I will start uh, with this question. Have you tried 
the active, uh, the active, uh, uh, the maximum because yes. active cutting, yeah. 650 millimeters. Exactly. So this is the maximum uh, that machine yes. can offer. Yes, with the maximum suction, yeah. could not come out with the flute needle. It could not come out with a straight cannula also. But because the only thing I didn't do was I was using a 23 gauge uh, uh, system. Exactly. Exactly. I did not make the 18 gauge system. I'm sure with an 18 gauge system, it may have come out, but I didn't want to spoil my whole surgery. And, and I think it's, it, it gets easy to aspirate silicone oil. If you have a shorter, shorter tip, like of the needle for the yes. BFCL and high power. Sometimes when it, whenever there is a very viscous material like Dinsiron, for example, when yes. you inject the Dinsiron which has the silicone, it will be, uh, unless you take it all as a once, if you leave some bubble down, it will sink down, it will come to you. And even though if you try to suck it with the tip of the silicone removal, it will not come. If you try the back flush, it will not come. So this is more or less the same case you you are uh, uh, you show it. This is working like Denzeron. Exactly. So what we what we uh, what I, I I have a case I may present it later uh, if I find it. They, they, uh, what I, I stuck with the same condition. So I bring the cannula, like what we removed the Denzeron. You can remove it with the cannula, but the cannula is very risky because it's mobile. When the tip come uh, out from the ball of the silicone you can aspirate the retina very easily and can create a damage to the retina itself because it's it's very change very strong change between high active the maximum sucking power uh, from a, a media which is very viscous to a media which is not so i i i bring a 18 needle gauge or 21 needle gauge whatever and i cut it as shorter as needed only because this is well minimized the needed vacuum power to suck it and we, we succeed to do it. But this is, is a very uh, interesting case, Dr. Danish. And this was right at the retinal surface. So you need the long, and this was a high myopic eye. Uh, so, this is unplus. Okay. Okay. Morgan, you okay. cannot make a small cut. You have Definitely. to go, you need a big cut. So I didn't want to use 18 gauge. So that's why I thought it's better to take out the PFCL and redo. And I was lucky that after removing the PFCL, it came out. Thank you very much for showing and participating. Dr. Ayman, do you have something to yeah, I add? think it's a very interesting. I, I have, I have all, almost a similar case that I've done two weeks ago. Uh, uh, myobic eye, uh, retinal detachment. Uh, it was vitreous hemorrhage with retinal detachment, prepared silicone oil, silicone oil removed after, uh, uh, I think, three months. Then six weeks uh, down the road, there was a PVR inferiorly. I went in and uh, I tried to remove the PVR. That's fine. I looked for any hole. There wasn't any hole at all, inferiorly. The, the detachment was inferior. So I, I just uh, put gas and I left uh, the eye. I saw the patient uh, one week later and there was two inferior small holes that I could recognize after I put the, the, the gas, I went in. You become muted, sir. You, you get muted, Dr. Ayman. Um, um, uh, 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 what I'm going to say is uh, I don't put uh, PFCL uh, routinely in these cases. Uh, I avoid to put, and if I want to put, I use to remove the silicone oil first, then I put the uh, PFCL low. I think this is PFCL, I think this is safer. Doing, doing it this way rather than the problem that happened with our senior colleague, Dr. Danish, that he managed very well. Thank you very much. Very interesting case. Thank you. And I think uh, now let me let me introduce my dear friend, Dr. Abdullah Al-Qahtani. Dr. Abdullah Al-Qahtani is an assistant professor in the surgical retina and ocular oncology at King Saud bin Abdul Aziz University for Health Science. Uh, at King uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, in Riyadh, and he's going to present this case. Dr. Abdullah, please, the panel is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, uh, for the introduction. And I will start with this one. So this is his, uh, uh, so this is his uh, uh, pediatric case, actually. It's a child with a trauma, has been operated since childhood with uh, congenital cataract. Then he was uh, given an artisan uh, lens and with the, uh, the time of the trauma happened during COVID-19, he stuck with it 
for like uh, one and a half year without uh, without uh, correction. He was not having an access to the hospital because most of the elective case was stopped on and off. So uh, uh, he came to our uh, uh, center, referred from the uh, other, and uh, we decide to remove the artisan lens and insert an ascrial fixation IOL at the same time. So as you see, it's a distorted iris in which uh, 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 you need to fix it. At the same time, uh, the IOL uh, has to be uh, removed. Uh, he was having also a decompensated cornea with, with on and off uh, uh, irritating of the cornea. So uh, we start him on a steroid, we decrease the IOP, and we uh, uh, decide to go in whenever the cornea become more uh, clearer. So this is, is an MTS forceps. It's a cared forceps, very helpful, very tool, uh, useful tools, whether Caesar or a forceps, just to create a good uh, iridoplasty. So I decide to uh, 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 try to create the uh, iridoplasty after I try to pull it and uh, uh, fix it. Uh, then uh, uh, I inject always uh, a visco uh, to keep the eye uh, uh, in contour uh, good shape. So this is the four haptic uh, lens for uh, for, uh, uh, or a or soft lens, and we use the Gore-Tex suture. Uh, there is an issue in this uh, step is you have to remember which one is distal to you, which one is uh, uh, proximal to you. So not to have any uh, tilted or uh, rotation of the lens inside the eye. So this is why I mark that the the one with the one with the marker before I uh, start introducing inside the eye. So I know exactly which one distal, which one is uh, proximal to me. So uh, we do it uh, uh, like, as you see, we insert it inside the needle, pull it out, the first thread, then the second thread with the same through the uh, trocar itself. Then we remove the trocar at the same time, just to avoid any uh, slippage. So this is the first side has been uh, done. The, we do the same things in the other side. And as I told you, you have to be very careful before you insert it inside the eye that all the threads in a, in a single platform without any tilting or uh, uh, misdirection. We do the same things through the needle. We take it out. Then We do the same things through the other. Needle. And uh, honestly, I found the uh, uh, MTS uh, forceps and Caesar very helpful in creating and manipulating the anterior chamber because it's curved. And whenever it's curved, you know, you have a good angle and direction rather than the straight, that one we use it for return. So this is already inside the eye. If it was a proline eight or something like that, I can rotate it and uh, put the knot inside the eye. Gortex, I found it a little bit uh, uh, easily slip it. So I decide not to tilt it much, especially it's a very uh, soft uh, suture in which you can just approach it to the uh, hole and suture it above. Uh, sometimes I do like an, a proximal wider uh, hole while distal narrower hole. So whenever uh, uh, I rotate the knot, it will be inside the bigger uh, sclerotomy, suturing the uh, conjunctiva and surgery is done in, in that way. Thank you. So this is the first part. Uh, I will accept any question till I found the density on removal. Maybe it's good to bring it uh, at the same time. So we thank, thank you, Doctor Abdullah. So this was this was a case of previous detachment. Uh, no, there is no, no detachment in this. There one, was actually. no detachment. Uh, no detachment. The, the retina was completely flat. Yeah, it, it was a very nice surgery. Uh, have you have you tried the Yamani technique in uh, in such cases, or you always try to to put the uh, acrius lens the four with with a, with the, with the uh, four haptics? You find uh, this, it easier uh, to do. 
Yemani technique is one of the best, but the issue is you have to have the special lens for it. You know, you need an uh, PFD, uh, uh, BDF. Uh, yes, BDF, uh, three, three piece lens, yes. Exactly, to, to, to have it crumble when you heat it. And I think it's the only in the market thickness and sensor of Zeiss. Yes. Maybe also uh, Okawa, uh, this is the third one that could be used for that technique. Otherwise, if you didn't have it, I don't think it's very nice to use the Alcon type. Alcon has a very- I, I don't record. use the Alcon type, in fact. The Zeiss type is the best to use, in fact. I, be, I believe so, actually. Yeah, yeah the, the Zeiss types is, 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 it was a very nice surgery. Thank you, Abdullah. Any, any, any one of the uh, dear colleague in the panel want to ask Dr. Abdullah anything? I have a question, if I may. Uh, I may, uh, yeah, please. Okay, it's a very quick, um, or it's actually a comment. We have Abdullah, it's a great uh, technique, and we have a big series of this. This is our preferred technique. But we find uh, if the knots rotates out, it actually causes granuloma. We had that in a couple of cases. So it might be best to try to bury it all times. And uh, an easy way is to hold from the ends of the suture, then just dip it down. So you're not manipulating the knot. So you hold the sutures and then go with the sutures in, a, in the sclerotomy, like a rabbit ears. That's, that's very true. And why I, I go out of, of layer and speak about it, because it's not always easy to dip it inside the, uh, yes. inside the eye. Sometimes if I'm afraid of slippage and opening the knot when it's already short, I prefer to leave it under the conjunctiva and we never have those granuloma. I think this is related to the immunity and all that stuff. But proline, proline is easier to be dipped inside. And if you use the proline, it should be eight rather than nine. I don't use 10 for that because it's very, very that soft and very fragile. A yeah, very thin could be, could be damaged. But this is, is a very known and, and uh, worth to be said, Dr. Ahmed, that if you decide to dip it inside the sclerotomy, it's always better to hold it through the net and dip it inside uh, uh, the eye. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Abdullah, for this nice presentation. I don't know if you see this, uh, Dr. Ayman. Yes, the technique. Yeah, so this is this is, is a, a, a right. insulin remnant. I don't know why it's. Uh, uh, maybe without voice is bitter. No? So I try to remove this dinsiron as Dr. Dennis said, it's very difficult to remove it. Even though with the, with the active sucking vacuum, even the cannula, I have tried and uh, it's still there. And this is, is as we said, the dinsiron remnant. This is why I hate dinsiron to be honest. It's very difficult to remove. So I decided to use 18 through the sclerotomy, 18 needle to create the sclerotomy. Then I put it inside uh, the eye and with the maximum vacuum. So whenever it, it, it doesn't suck, I need to break the needle as short as it's only needed. Because as shorter the needle is, as capable the, machi the machine will be able to suck the, the material. It's very viscous. It's need a very strong machine to, to suck it out. And since we have a maximum of 650, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, left in our hand, only two things, either to have a wider, wider uh, uh, syringe or to have a shorter syringe, whatever, whatever needle you, you need, uh, uh, parameters you need to play with. So I, I try to suck it and I cut it small, small. Whenever it's out, it's uh, shortening. Yeah? So I'm, I'm shortening it. And it's very easy to break it. Just make sure it's not very sharp so you don't distort the, the sclerotomy whenever you put it in. So I, I try to uh, become closer now. It's very dangerous, but I don't complete suck it closer to the optic. Whenever it's become easy and less weight, I raise it up, I suck it, and I finish uh, the case. So this is just uh, because the, Dr. Danish remind us for uh, for the uh, the difficult cases. And thank you very much for uh, being patient with me. Okay. Thank you, Abdullah. This was a very smart way <laughs> removing this this uh, uh, stop on uh, uh, bubble of uh, Vinceron. I think, yeah, uh, 
This was really nice, uh, removing it. Uh, what, what I say is just sometimes if you, if you inject uh, heavy liquid harshly or quickly in the presence of silicon oil or heavy silicon oil, as uh, Dr. Danny said, it is going to be mixed with the silicon oil and some of it will, will be stuck at, at, at the retina. This is, this is a problem. I, I, I used to avoid it, avoid it completely. I, I never do it uh, because when it happens, it's, it's a headache, in fact. But I, this, is, I, this is a very nice way of removing it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. And I see Dr. Faisal is there already. Dr. Faisal Fayyad. <laughs> Good evening, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Happy to see all these smiley faces, friendly faces. Thank you very much. I'll start sharing my screen here. Please. Share, share. And uh, here we go. I'm presenting just one single case. I was asked my presentation in three minutes and five minutes discussion. And this is the case that I want to present. This is 40 years old male with the previous multiple retina surgery with macular hole, posterior and anterior severe PVR. And uh, this is the case. I think there is a lot of discussion afterwards. This is how I started the case. I, I place the band. <clears throat> I like to peel once again. I always repeat it under silicone oil because I think the retina is more firm under silicone oil. Then I remove the silicone oil and <clears throat> I peel PVR membranes posteriorly, then anteriorly. I use forceps and forceps technique in order to remove the anterior PVR membranes and you can see them there. I'm not a big fan of just cutting the retina before deciding to cut the retina or not. I have to do the maximum peeling that I can. And this is the way I do it. And uh, you know, if I decide to cut the retina immediately, I have to cut very posteriorly, something that I dislike very much. And I try once to do any uh, retinotomy or retinectomy to do it as much anterior as I can. And uh, this is, the previous surgeon has peeled the ILM, but not totally. There's the macular hole. And here I peel the ILM, continue peeling under heavy liquids. It's a quite large macular hole. And here I decide to do quite large inferior retinectomy. And here, since I did retinectomy, I take piece of the retina at the edge of the retinectomy. And this is the way I, I do it. I don't go on the surface of the retina. I just hold it in this way so I don't damage the photoreceptors in the macular area. And I place it over the macular hole. can see it it's placed properly. You know, you have to cover the macular hole that was concerned. Now, since I made sure that it was covered, I removed what is left from the, what, what I preserved there of the ILM. This is how it looks like at the end of the case, direct exchange, and I got the retina flat. Just before removing the silicone oil, I did the no CT. This is how the graft looks like. And I removed the silicone oil without the problems. The patient is very happy. This is how it looks like. Those are small cystic changes inside the macular area that eventually disappeared. This is my case, a three minutes video, and this is it.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Faisal, for this nice uh, presentation, as usual. And uh, uh, I'd like to have just one question, which is, uh, how do you find the visual acuity after closure of those uh, difficult cases? Well, you know, our aim, of course, our gold standard is vision recovery. But in such cases, you know, they, they, they don't have great vision after the surgery. I think this patient ended 0.1, something like that, 0.1, not more than that. Uh, you know, vision is important, but the main thing is, is to flatten the retina, of course. But uh, at least in my hands, this is what I, I could achieve. Dr. Ayman. Faisal, this is a great, great, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, Abdullah. Can yeah, we, uh, Mike is you, Dr. Ayman. Thank you. Faisal, this is a very interesting case. My, my question, uh, you had the ability to remove part of the retina because of the PVR and you, you have to, to dissect and, and remove part of that retina. But if let's say you don't, you don't have anything, the retina was flat, only this big hole, uh, what would be your alternative? Would you use the- uh, yeah, You know, I- Or would you use, the, you take part of the retina the same as you did? No, I mean, I mean the options here, well, I left some of the ILM attached to the ILM just in case, just to stick it inside the hole. Uh, but um, I thought that I could take a piece of the retina at, at the tear edge. I mean, it was not a great job. I mean, just to cut the retina because the, 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 the retinectomy, it was already there. Just I had to take a small piece of that retina and just uh, to cover the macular hole with it. Yeah, but I mean, I, I usually, you know, we go on the surface of the retina taking the that piece of the retina, but I might damage the photoreceptors. That's why I do it in that way. I mean, just I hold it uh, and just like the airplane, just come from above posteriorly to cover the macula in order not to damage the photoreceptors. For, for how long do you I'm, keep this, the, the silicone oil face are you doing in this case? Well, about, I mean, eight weeks, the maximum. Eight weeks. But I mean, I mean, I mean, eight weeks because- Or you depend on the OCT. Usually, no, no. Usually PVR cases, I keep them eight weeks, 10 weeks, the maximum. Because if, if PVR does not occur, it will not occur. If it occurs, then I have to go back to surgery to intervene once again. But in this case, nothing occurred because, but, I mean, we cleaned the vitreous very nicely. We peeled everything that is to be peeled. And uh, there was no point of keeping the silicone oil more than that inside the yeah. eye. Yeah, it will cause more problems later. Uh, yeah. Ramzi, yes, uh, you wonderful. were saying. It was a okay, wonderful. Ramzi, uh, you want to see something, please? Uh, thank you. Hi, Faisal. Uh, it's a great case as usual. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, as I noticed, the uh, ILM is peeled already in the previous surgery, but the temporal part of unpeeled ILM area was very close to the macular hole, as I noticed. Or am I wrong? I don't know, because uh, I show see on see, uh, the video. So I would prefer in this patient maybe the other technique, as uh, I mentioned. As, a temporal inverted flap over cover the macular hole area. I think it would be uh, possible in this case because I have some such case when the previous uh, surgery, the peeling ILM area is small area and this uh, unpeeled ILM is closed, we can uh, cover, uh, uh, create an ILM uh, flap. And, and in such uh, patient, uh, I think it's, ILM uh, covered the macular area as a single layer so with uh, inverted flap uh, as functional uh, recovery is better than uh, retinal uh, auto, uh, auto retinal graft. What do you think about this in this case? You might be right. I know about your work, uh, Ramsey, about uh, a temporal inverted flap. It works nice. I'm using it, uh, I mean, in many of my cases. But I thought in this case, Maybe, maybe it was more proper. The macular hole was quite large. And uh, I thought of giving more mobility to the retina in order to make a large ILM. And uh, it was not difficult to harvest piece of the retina from the periphery. That's why I opted for this op 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 option. I mean, 
I, I think our goal just to flatten the retina and to give the patient the maximum uh, vision recovery as we can. And there are many ways. Everyone has his own way. I think you are right. Temporal inverted flap, it works nice, but it ended in this case. I mean, that flap, it worked as well. But I agree. I agree with you. There was some uh, 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 ILM left on the temporal part of the hole. It could have been, it could have worked. I have no idea. This is what I showed you what I did. Thank you, Dr. Faisal. Was was very nicely done, and I think uh, we should pass to Dr. Mangat. Uh, Dr. Mangat, please, uh, the mic is yours, and it's always a pleasure to have you uh, in this uh, meeting. And hope to see you all uh, uh, physically, as Dr. Ayman said it before. The mic is yours, Dr. Uh, Mangat, and you are yes, muted. Yes, yes, oh, yes. Okay. Sorry, if you can tell the next speaker if. Uh... Uh, sure, sure. sure. So we I can, have some, yeah, I have some issue with the. Yeah, I, I think the idea is to share location uh, after you open uh, uh, the. No, the actually, file. the wrong. Uh, yeah, the wrong case is coming. So I think I did a mistake. Oh, okay, so I we will look for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we can yes, start yes. with uh, Dr. Ramsey. Yeah. Is uh, it's a great pleasure to be with us uh, today, and uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. So, uh, dear colleague, uh, tonight uh, I would like to present a case with complex retinal detachment treated with larger retinectomy and discuss with you the risk cause of chronic hypotony. So, this patient referred to us from another center after the first surgery. Uh, and as you see, this is total retinal detachment and severe PVR to the both posterior and anterior. And also 360 as a retinal defect behind the equator is very close to posterior pole. First, I try to remove the membrane and try to reattach the retina, but all the membrane was located the retinal tear area. When I peel the membrane, all the, the small tear became uh, connected and, guess, and then the large tear, as you will see now, as you see. So, um, it continued to peel, but the membrane was uh, provide connection between the anterior and the posterior flap of retina. And therefore, um, I stopped to peel from the posterior part and looked at the superior. There was, the retina was more intact in that area and start to, same, to do the same things, but again, the same uh, problem. So then um, I did uh, not continue to peel the membrane and decide to remove all anterior retinal for up 360 degree and apply diatermy uh, first, just only to the uh, large vessels area. And I noticed that the connection between an anterior retina was the um, region of large vessels, except this area, the retina was uh, already uh, teared uh, from posterior to anterior. And uh, after uh, selective uh, diatermy, uh, I apply uh, retinectomy using with vitrectomy probe. And in this period, uh, I uh, inject PFCL to stabilize the posterior retina. Uh, when I finish complete uh, 360 retinectomy, I give more uh, PFCL to attach the posterior retina. I like to keep the attached the uh, retina during procedure because uh, PFCL helps to flatten uh, retina as an iron during procedure. Then I remove all anterior retinal flap 360 degree um, and pay attention to remove all retina. This is the uh, final position of the posterior retina. It's very small piece of retina remain in the eye and a very large area of retinectomy. But I pay great uh, care. I uh, took a great care to clean all retina from and the so there are also vitreous space and the vitreous cleaning on the uh, periphery of the retina to prevent anterior PVR and traction on the ciliar body. And this, I think this is important in such patients. We should not leave any piece of retina or vitreous uh, at the periphery of the retina. Then I apply two, three uh, row uh, laser uh, retina and uh, give uh, 1,000 cent stock silicone oil uh, in this patient. As Faisal uh, mentioned, uh, I keep the silicone in such eyes uh, if there's no hypertony, like 
eight or 10 weeks or at maximum 12 weeks, not more than uh, three months. Uh, and uh, after the silicon oil injection, you will see the final position of the eye. This is uh, three months after surgery, the final position, the vision was 0.16. And the pressure was 60 millimeter mercury with one antiglucomatose medication. Uh, as you know, there has been a um, concern uh, that the wider uh, retinectomy, larger retinectomy may provide chronic hypotony uh, as a result of exposed RPE leading to uh, more uh, choroidal outflow. However, uh, this, page, this case shows us that this may not be true and ciliary body shut down due to the anterior PVR and traction on the ciliary body may be the main problem or the main reason rather than the nectar for chronic hypotony. So this is the end of my uh, talk. I would like to uh, hear your comment and your uh, experience about in such case. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ramsey, for this wonderful case. Uh, just fast question. Uh, you said, so you do a very, very uh, good indentation and shaving of all the base of the vitreous to avoid those uh, hypotony. Yeah. And do you see a PVR usually after this uh, uh, ret uh, excessive retinectomy, for example? Do you increase the dose of steroid post-op or something rather than just normal retina or is the same? Um... Yes, sometimes we can observe uh, PVR, especially in this patient, we observe uh, PVR around the retinectomy uh, and some uh, not on the center of the retina. Uh, and if there's a PVR and we should go to the, into the eye, remove silicon oil and do the same procedure again. But um, in this patient, uh, the uh, management of inflammation after surgery is important as you notice. And uh, sometimes, not in all cases, but in, especially in young patients, in child, child, in elderly patients, less than 40, 45 years old, I prefer uh, systemic steroid treatment at least five days or one week after surgery uh, to uh, control inflammation in, the, in such patients. But except this, I do not use another medication. Like, like how, how many drops of penicillin? How was your regime? Of those cases. Could you please could you please repeat again? Yeah. I couldn't see hear you. How how many drops of prednisolone, for example, post op? Um, uh, uh, I uh, order prednisolone uh, every uh, one drop every hour uh, during the day, and uh, and also uh, ointment uh, during God sleep uh, during the midnight uh, during the night. So in the day, like sixteen drops, sixteen hours during sixteen hours. I order uh, one drop uh, prednisolone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayman. So I think- Ramzi, uh, yes, uh, this is a, uh, sorry, Ramzi, this is a very important yeah, sure. case. The two big problems, as you said, in these cases is the, the anterior PVR causing hypotony, uh, the one that you've managed perfectly, and the PVR that you don't have uh, any control over it. Uh, now, if the PVR uh, is going to happen, usually, happen in the first few weeks after after surgery, four to eight weeks. Now, when do you think is the proper time to go in? Would you wait until the PVR mature or would you go, go early? Uh, what would you do? How do you manage these okay. cases? Uh, first, uh, let me say something about the proliferation, the reproliferation, uh, Ayman. Uh, in such case, if we pay attention to clean all the vitro space, if we do not leave any any scalp fault like retinal uh, flap or vitreous, I rarely see P anterior PVR. Uh, yeah, I'm talking. But, I'm talking yeah. PVR around the edge of the of the retinal. Flap. Yeah, but you can see in the posterior uh, PVR. This is Usually what I'm saying. In, the, uh, in that patient, if there's a PVR on the posterior retina and around the retina, uh, I do not ever in a hurry to do the second surgery, but at least. Um, four to six weeks, I wait, uh, sometimes uh, eight weeks, and then uh, go to surgery. Because in such patients, usually they have a past history, like several surgeries. And therefore, inflammation also is a very important. We should control inflammation, and then we can uh, go to second other surgery. I think it's, uh, it's better than to do a very frequent uh, surgery. Uh, 
but they prefer at least six or eight weeks uh, after the surgery i prefer to go again to the absolutely surgery. so you wait for the for this pvr to mature a little bit before yeah. you go in that, that, that that's, that's absolutely right and that's then the first reason but yeah, yeah that go is ahead. the first uh, the reason but the other one and to control inflammation again i really care about the inflammation absolutely and well in these cases uh, uh, do you do you keep the silicone oil more after the second surgery or do you tend to remove it after 10 to 12 weeks after yeah, I mean, in such patients the removal of silicone oil is not only uh, the proliferation happen also the other causes chronic hypotony as you know in such eyes that all we have really huge experience i know and the main problem is such patient is, is chronic hypotony is more than a proliferation. Absolutely. And if there is chronic, if there is hypotony, we never remove silicone oil. Absolutely. But uh, this is this is this case is really teach me. And uh, what's the main reason of chronic hypotony? And the uh, large retinectomy, I think it's not the main problem really, as I mentioned. And the uh, ciliary body uh, situation is much more important than the large retinectomy. Absolutely. And therefore, uh, yeah. if there's chronic hypotony, we should look again to the ciliary body around ciliary body if there's an traction or proliferation. But if there's chronic hypotony, we never uh, remove silicone oil in such patients. Absolutely, know. absolutely. Definitely, this is just to stress again that the anterior PVR should be removed from the surface of, of the retina and the ciliary body to avoid such a complication. And sometimes even by doing this, you cannot avoid it. You still have hypotony uh, in these cases. Thank you very, very, very much. It's really thank you, a very thank you, Dr. Simon. Thank you, Dr. Ramzi. I think we should pass to Dr. Yes. Ahmed Salam because we are late in time. And it's a great pleasure to have you, Dr. Ahmed, uh, with us as usual, very, uh, very active. And uh, uh, we will be happy to give you the mic. Well, thank you so much, Irene. I'm enjoying all the discussion. We really. think I want to even hear more than uh, present myself. I cannot share the screen. Can you? We, can we pass the screen? Uh, I think Dr. Ray Dogra is on the screen. So maybe if you if he wants to present now, I'm happy to wait. Dr. Mangad, are you willing to present now? Do you? You're muted. You're muted, Dr. Mangad. You, you can see my screen now. We can yes, see sir. and we can hear properly okay. now. If you okay. like to present. Okay. Uh, I, I, okay, I have just a very simple case uh, uh, to show to you here. So, uh, so this is a 52 year old male uh, who was one eyed patient, basically when I was enucleated and he had a sudden uh, diminution of vision and it was count finger in this eye. And uh, the eye was like this, you see that, in fact, uh, so you can all see, this is a very typical uh, uh, narrowing of the arcade drag. And you can see this is a typical what happens in cases of uh, familial exudative uh, uh, retinopathy. And uh, since he was one-eyed and uh, this kind of picture was there, so uh, we planned it for surgery. So the surgery basically, although he was one-eyed, I thought, uh, let's try doing this uh, with the, let me see, yeah, yeah. So uh, basically I, why I am presenting this case, I always try to put a band in such a case, 240 band, because the, the problem is the uh, peripheral retina, there's a lot of traction and you can't go there and remove that. And uh, these kind of cases, uh, the problem is that you can't, uh, remove these membranes, peel these membranes, or even go beyond, I would say equator, because that was my problem here also. So I could remove it up to that level. And beyond that, I thought I'm going to create a hydrogenic break and I'm not going to go there. So after removing all this, you can see that uh, there's a little bleed also. And, uh, and the adhesions in these cases is so firm that uh, even if we try to, uh, of course, uh, this blood was removed. Uh, I have not done uh, much after uh, removing this blood. I, could, I, I only did uh, laser uh, 
over the, this is the band which I have applied first uh, to 40 as well as a little bit posteriorly and uh, left it uh, as such. Uh, and uh, I did air food exchange and put a SF6 uh, uh, gas here. So this is uh, what uh, we achieved. Uh, uh, and uh, subsequently you can see here uh, how it looked like. And I, I just want to show that uh, once you remove this, this uh, you see uh, narrowing, this will become much less, as well as uh, you can see here in the OCT uh, that the whole thing has flattened down and the patient could recover 624 vision. So my question here is, how do you manage such cases? Do you put a band all the time? Uh, how you, uh, 240 band for periphery? And secondly, how uh, much you can peel these membrane and uh, is it the right thing to stop, which I did in this case? Because sometimes we, this was an elderly patient, but we have a lot of children where we have to do surgery and uh, we really face a challenging situation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mangat, for this nice case. And I think this will liberate a lot of controversy between those <laughs> Patrick to me, uh, seeker and uh, Bandel Buckler. So uh, I would I would be happy to hear either of, uh, each of us. I will start by myself. I didn't do combined at the same time, either Patrick to me or Bandel, and very extremely rare, almost zero if I combined both. Dr. Danish, what do you think? So you know, in this, if I think the traction is not completely relievable, I would put not the band, but I would put a buckle. I would put it to, because for shortening, a 276 would work better than just a band. So, so band, not a retinectomy. Two, not, two, a retin no, not a retinectomy. Definitely not a retinectomy. Okay. And the peripheral vitreous, you know, it has a posterior insertion. So you're right not to go beyond that. But the vitreous content, which is there anteriorly, I would just shave it as close to the retina as possible. And that I would do meticulously uh, very slowly till I complete the whole thing. And, Dr. and I would actually laser that entire path. Rather than doing a layer of laser, I would laser it to the aura so of that course. it becomes yeah. a new aura. And we will, we will hope it will stuck in its place yeah. even after all that laser. Yes. Dr. Ahmed, you combined? Yes, a fantastic case. I would do, uh, I, I think in these cases, the important thing is not to create any tears. So I would do exactly the same. Maybe I would put a band or not. I'm not sure. But that's what also I do in diabetics. I avoid the retinectomy because in like, if this was a diabetic, I would have done the same. Peel the center. And this is the important thing is to clear the center. And that's why this patient has good vision. I know, I know Ahmed, you do sometimes core vitrectomy for the simple cases. You are not a big fan of total vitrectomy, isn't it? No, I think in, a, in diabetics or in ROP or in fever, if you have a tear, and if you have a retinectomy, I feel you lost the case and it's oil forever and very poor vision because now you have the fibrovascular disease and on top PVR. So I would avoid that situation. Uh, Dr. Mangat? fraction, I would just relieve the, the center. So thank, my thank question you. remains so, still about the periphery. If you yeah, don't support, because you can only, you can shave the vitreous, you can remove the vitreous, but the adhesion is so strong and you have those, uh, you see, uh, proliferations happening there. So if we don't yeah, support I, that, is it going to lift up? That is why I always put a band in these. I cases. think if the so center was see. relieved, it's fine. But I think this is great. This is really fantastic. The the main thing is not to end up with a break. Yes. So Dr. Dr. Ayman, what do you I think? Th I think I, I would start with a buckle. Definitely, I, I, I definitely agree with Dr. Danish. I, I will start putting a buckle in these cases because I think it, it's definitely in children, it's a great help. Uh, number one, it will relieve a little bit of traction if I'm going to go ahead and do vitrectomy and they give me a lot of support. And as uh, Ahmed said, the problem is to create uh, tears or holes in these cases. Uh, uh, they will end up with PVR and the retina will not settle again. So definitely I will start with a bucket. Okay. Uh, Dr. Faisal, fastly, please. Or I, I see Mohammed Ramari is upset from us. You want us to finish in time? I think, no, no, Ahmed, just I'm enjoying, enjoying listening to you. Take your time, Ahmed. Abdullah. So, Ahmed, please. Ahmed. Yes. 
I'll go ahead and share as of you as you're uh, listening to Dr. Fayad. Dr. Fayad, oh, thank please. You. You're very, very valuable Ahmed. comment. What, what, what do you will say? No, I, I, think there is, I, I think there is no harm from having a band around the eye. Just, just remember in stage four ROP, before vitrectomy, still sometimes we use a scleral band instead of vitrectomy. There is no harm at all from having a band around the eye. And this band, you can remove it at any time once the situation is, is, is stable. Combined, uh, I agree with, with a scleral band. Combined. Absolutely. So yes, you'll go absolutely. for combined. Okay. Yes, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Ahmed, please. Your, uh, yes. So uh, this is one of our, what I call X files. So it's uh, like a complication file. I just want to uh, direct attention to two things that happens in about 50% uh, of ERM is that the internal limiting membrane can have a dehiescence. And also, you can have skises of the nerve fiber layer going through that uh, dehiscence. And that's very important for the reasons I'm going to show. So remember, it's about 50% actually of cases. So this is our first case here. Uh, standard epiretinal membrane with actually poor vision. The retina is significantly distorted. And that's preoperative here. And once you see that sharp demarcation line, there's a break in the internal limiting membrane, and there might be a nerve fiber layer skysis like this spaghetti sign. So always remember this. And that's actually me here uh, peeling. So we start from the area of the dehiescence. It's a good area to start. So that's a good point. But then I want to show you what not to do. And in these cases, the epiretinal membranes are very adherent. So maybe don't peel like what I'm doing, peel more tangentially, like what I started to do now, because they could be very adherent as you're gonna see. And then the important point is you see this white line of uh, nerve fiber layer, um, uh, whitish material or uh, stasis do not peel there because there's no ILM there. That's a nerve fiber layer. So do not peel there. And it's just good to know, really, and that's nerve fiber layer. And here's a white line cannot be peeled and nerve fiber layer. For the sake of time, I'll go quickly through it. And this patient really did so well, her vision improved. And I had a, an extra macular hole here, which I think it did not really come from any pulling or traction, but probably just peeling the ARM, which you've seen in some cases. That's the second case. Uh, same thing here, epiretinal membrane and vitromacular traction. And that's us here. You can see this is the area here, but we did not look carefully to the OCT pre-op because then we would have identified that there's a skysis area here down because then once we start peeling, once the fellows start peeling, actually the whitish area was not the membrane, was a skysis area down there. So always be aware of that. So any whitish area, just check, make sure there's no sky and don't peel over it. And then we just searched the retina peel, then we did uh, intraoperative OCT. There was only like uh, a partial thickness, no full thickness, and we just left the eye uh, with air. And I'll run that for the sake of time. And that's the postoperative uh, appearance here. And there are no retinal holes that happen. And a third case, a high myopic patient, and you can see here the skysis area as well with this like uh, demarcated line and the nerve fiber layer skysis and ILM diacence. And I want to show you something here that happened really, where we only identified with the VAR technology, as I say, looking back at the video. So here peeling, and then you will see here next, is we were just peeling on the ERM ILM and that broke the retina. We did not touch the retina. So it's just very adherent. So we did the same thing as well. Just peel around it and um, air fill. And again, here, interoperative OCT, we didn't see a full thickness, but even if we found a full thickness, we just put air or gas in the eye. And then here the area, and this patient did well as well. So I think the message really is that these are present in about 50% of cases, and there are strong ILM attachment. There is no ILM on the whitish area, which is a retinal fiber layer crisis, and do not peel there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very Thank much. you, Ahmed, very much.
for this um, a nice nice cases. My question to you is, uh, when, when when we do these cases, sometimes we end up with a remnant of uh, you know thickened retina and fluid in the area, and the vision does not improve that much, and you are frustrated. The patient is frustrated. Uh, what is your your management in these cases? How much would you wait before uh, interfering or treating? Uh, uh, the flu. Yeah, so I think that this would be best sorted preoperatively. So always in the vision is not good. I tell the patient that we expect some improvement, but not good improvement. The second thing I usually do not, uh, I also tell the patient we have to wait at least three months before saying that that's most likely like the end vision, although it may improve a little bit late. Third, I usually do not intervene more in these patients uh, unless there's a, a strong traction that I think we can relieve. Otherwise, I best leave alone. Have you, have you tried, Ahmed, using Ozardex, let's say yeah. six months uh, uh, or more after surgery when there is a re remnant of, of fluid in the retina? Yeah, I, I've tried and we, and actually I'm a fan of putting interoperative Ozardex as well at the same time. I don't think it makes a difference. That's my view, but we've tried a lot and I don't Dr. think it makes a difference. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, Dr. Ahmed, for the nice presentation. Dr. Faisal or... Uh, Dr. Mangat, if you have any comment or question. No, the message is clear by Ahmad Salam. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank I mean, you. No, the message is very clear. And uh, uh, really, this is my recommendation as well for my fellows. Once I have fellows, just don't don't peel once there is white macula there. Yeah, the message Thank is you. very clear. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Ahmed, how do you feel the OCT during the OR? Is it very helpful? I think it's, I, I don't think it's a game changer. It's only a game changer if you're not sure, for example, you peel the ERM, you think that I create a full thickness macular hole. Shall I peel the ILM or not? I prefer not to peel the ILM. I like to do simple surgery. So I think interoperative OCT is very nice. Uh, it's also like fascinating, really. We found like a vortex of the, you know, a varix of the vortex vein, we found an area which we're thinking, is this a schisis or a detachment? Then we redo the OCT peripheral and we find <laughs> it's a nice schisis. But I think it's a game changer only in that area. Did I create a hole or not? Uh, peeling the ARM and shall we do more or just leave it like this? If you get only one of two choices, 3D or, or OCT? No, CD is my love. I love operating heads up. It's like changed my life. Really. And the, <laughs> everyone so in the room sees it and like everyone gets excited in the room. Uh, Dr. Faisal, I see you smiling. You have another... Yeah, but because I have a 3D, I love it. I mean, well, I'm still doing some uh, surgery with the microscope, but I would say that over 95% of my surgeries now are 3D. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I think this is our our time, Dr. Mohammed Al Amri. Is it? Is it? Is it? I think, very uh, I think we, we stick we stick to time, Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, we still have one minute. We still have one oh, minute. You have more than that. More than that, Abdullah. You can go ahead. It's very interesting. Uh, well, I think if someone everyone... has another comment, Dr. Ayman or anybody, I want to comment that uh, Dr. Amri looks very handsome with this he very does, nice yeah. tie. You know, I'm getting younger. <laughs> only this one, only for today. For the it's, last, it's, session, it's, you know? it's pleasure for the closing. It's pleasure. For the closing. Yeah, it's pleasure to 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 uh, have seen uh, all of my dearest colleagues, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Salam, uh, Dr. Dagra, and definitely Dr. Faisal. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, uh, session and for the nice presentations. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for, for chairing the session, too. Thank you. Actually, it was a very, nice very nice session. Very nice session. One short comment that just came to my mind. Please, Please Ahmed. Yeah, it's actually very short. And I, I think one of the best things really is having a fellow. It's so really... Um, so rewarding to see the fellow do surgery and even do surgery better than you. So I would say anyone who's in academic practice, definitely have a fellow. You're actually, you're not benefiting uh, 10 or 20 patients. You're benefiting thousands and thousands of patients Absolutely. because that fellow will go and operate and on operate and operate. And actually it's a amal uh, salah will, that will stay for, for us. So I think definitely <laughs> have a fellow if you can. Absolutely, absolutely, Ahmed. I congratulate you, definitely.
Thank you very much. I would like thank to thank you. Dr. Thank Muhammad Al Amri for the organization, Dr. Faisal, Dr. Ayman, Dr. Manga, Ahmed Salam, also Dr. Ramzi. He left for uh, a, a wedding and he shared uh, a valuable part of his time with us. I would like to thank you all, all the attendees, and the mic is your, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah, for this uh, interesting session, actually. And we can say the last, but not the least, and the best, I think, I have seen and heard and I was following you very nicely. All dear friends and colleagues here, they are here. So um, uh, on behalf of uh, executive committee, I would like to thank first of all, all the scientific committee who participate in making this uh, uh, scientific program uh, with uh, an eminent and highly specialized uh, ophthalmologist from all the world. Um, a special thanks also for all attendees. They join us until this minute and they are still with us until now. Uh, thanks for all speakers, actually. Without them, we cannot do anything. Thanks for everyone who participate with us. And it was an excellent and it was a pleasure and honor to have uh, uh, this kind and eminent speaker and friends and colleagues and teachers, actually. So we learn a lot, even I'm running from each, I have three uh, laptops, one on the right, left, so here to here, but still um, I focus sometimes on something that I can learn and really I learn. Um, I'd like to thank all the sponsoring company for their uh, support us, uh, uh, for Novartis, Bayer Allergan, for Bosch and Lump and uh, ITRAM, uh, and I think, um, uh, MBC and um, yes, and uh, others. Sorry if, if I miss anyone. Uh, so I'd like to thank the management event. They are, they have done a great job with us and there is no anything that we feel there is any mistakes. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I would like to thank you all, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Ayman, Faisal and Danish, my dear friends all the times he is here and all the times and Dr. Mangata and all others. Uh, also, at the end, I would like just to share this screen with you from the management, if they can share the screen. I invite all dear friends that we are preparing for the uh, physical, uh, personal face, in fa uh, face on face in uh, October 14 to 16 in Dubai. It will be the fourth NEOM conference meeting. Uh, we hope the situation, situation goes well and we can have you all uh, in Dubai. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we apologize for any inconvenience, and thanks for all. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, very thank you much. dear friends. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.